Hey there, public land owners. Welcome to another edition of BHA's uh, Public Land Skills Night presented by Filson. Tonight, we have a fun and informative Upland seminar brought to you by two Montana BHA members, Courtney Bastion and Hannah Nikanow. But before we dive into that, I did want to give a shout out to Filson, who is making these uh, Skills Nights possible. In celebration of Public Lands Month, Filson and BHA have partnered up to offer some co-branded merchandise, so made by Filson, featuring the BHA logo. Um, there's some portions that go back to BHA's mission of supporting our wild public lands, waters, and wildlife. And uh, there's a vest, there's a hat, there's a beanie, there's a t-shirt. Um, all these items are available at filson.com. Definitely encourage you to go check them out. Support Filson, support BHA, and get some really good gear in the process. Additionally, uh, one lucky viewer tonight, is gonna be going home with the Filson duffel bag. It's a $274 value. That's just a perk for tuning in and watching this free seminar. And big shout out to Filson for making that door prize happen as well. Courtney Bastion and Hannah Nikanow are experts in all things upland hunting. From identifying ideal bird habitat to selecting and training uh, the right upland bird dog, these gals got you. Courtney is a BHA member who started upland hunting about 10 years ago as a way to get out in the woods with her German wired hair pointers and allow them to do what they were bred for. She's a canine nutrition consultant for Purina Pro Plan, which is really hard to say. Uh, she trains bird dogs. Uh, pointers specifically at Cladow Kennel outside of Missoula, Montana. And she's also the voice behind the Bird Dog Babe podcast, something you definitely want to go give it a listen. Hannah Nikanow is a Montana BHA Life member and communication specialist for the Intermountain West Joint Venture, a conservation organization that focuses on bird habitat. Hannah Nikanow has been figuring out the art of upland hunting for the last eight years, seven of which she's been chasing around Rye, her wired hair pointing Griffon, and most recently, she's been chasing around her nine-month-old poodle pointer, Bannock. Cute little ball of fur. Uh, she's been chasing around birds behind both of those bird dogs across the mountains and prairies of Montana and her home state of Wyoming. Um, I have the honor of calling Hannah a close friend of mine. And uh, unfortunately, Leo here is not the best hunting dog. So I owe both my first pheasant and my first sharp tail to Hannah and Rye. I think you'll find that the tips and tricks shared by these ladies are definitely on point. Okay, enjoy. Well, um, uh, two bird dog babes between bird dogs. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> I'm Hannah Nickenow. And I'm Courtney Bastion. And we are doing a virtual backcountry hun hunters and anglers skill seminar. So the reason you're talking to me is because I work for the Intermountain West Joint Venture. It's a bird, a migratory bird habitat organization. We're a program of the Fish and Wildlife Service, but I'm also an adult onset upland hunter. So I've had to learn things um, my own way by doing a lot of research. <laughs> How about you? I'm Courtney Bastion. I am the host of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. I am also a BHA member and a consultant for Purina Pro Plan. I am here to share a little bit about my uh, background with bird dogs and hunting experience. I've been hunting for about 10 years, so I also am an adult onset hunter, probably just like many of you. And I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah, we're going to divide it up a little bit. Um, kind of the section I'm going to talk about is how to find the birds. I'm going to talk about the habitat. You know, we didn't have the benefit of walking in our daddy's boot steps and figuring out where birds like to live. So I'm going to talk about habitat, what birds are needing on the landscape, and then what we can do as hunters to figure that out to find birds. And you're going to talk to us about bird dogs. <laughs> okay, so you've decided that you're interested in bird hunting, but you need to figure out where to look for, for those birds. So kind of the way we talk about uh, habitat conservation is if you don't have good habitats, you don't have birds, you don't have, you know, good uh, game species. So, you know, so much of wildlife conservation revolves around, you know, taking care of the places these animals live. So when, when I am in the early fall and I am starting to look for some of the bird species we have in beautiful Western Montana, I'm thinking about those brood groups. So those groups of 
uh, young birds that are often still with their hens, but they can fly and they're starting to explore, but they're still developing their feathers. So I'm wondering like, okay, what are those birds eating? And you know, when the birds are young, they need those high protein sources. So those are forbs. So those are leafy plants, not grasses that have really high nutrition and protein for young grown birds and bugs. So I'm looking when I'm kind of out scouting or hunting in the early fall, I'm looking for, you know, those lush riparian areas, those wet green meadows that aren't, you know, cured out and brown late already that late in the season that have retained some of that moisture. If I'm seeing grasshoppers, if I'm seeing clover and dandelions, that is money for young birds. Um, you know, if, if you're out kind of in the more prairie systems, you're looking for those spring seeps that have remained green or leaky sock tanks often have a little fringe of that will have great, um, you know, those leafy plants for the birds to be eating as well as those bugs that they, they really need. But when you're getting later into the fall, those birds are uh, wanting to load up on carbs, you know, grains and berries and seeds. So, you know, that's a higher fat food that they are seeking out and also thinking about building up for, for the winter, for those cold hard months. So I'm looking for edges of habitat to so like, you know, grain fields and native prairie is like an awesome place that birds are going to be moving in between for their, you know, their resting and their loafing and their um, kind of the, that habitat where they have that good cover and uh, protection from predators. But then they're, you know, going out into these other habitats looking for those, you know, high value carbs that will sustain them throughout that time of year. So habitat diversity is important. Birds need food, water, and that nesting, hiding, loafing cover. And so, you know, food, think of those different things that birds are eating at various times of the year. You know, water out, out kind of further west, water is king in, in so many senses. Um, but kind of looking for those places that those birds can get water, kind of direct liquid water sources, or kind of those lush resources that birds who maybe don't need direct water, say like sage grouse and sharp tail, they don't need to always drink directly. They get their water through their food sources. So kind of thinking in that general area. And then, you know, that that timber cover and that diversity of, of hiding habitat. So edges of, you know, cuts and burns with like your thicker riparian, um, you know, grain fields to prairie, you know, that neighbor habitat, um, wet meadows in ag fields, like those kind of that diversity of habitat type. I found is, is really important for, you know, finding birds, um, you know, when you're out on the landscape. But, you know, prior to, you know, pounding the ground, scouting is so important for birds. You do it for your big game, you go out and you glass the hills. It isn't that different for birds. Like, like maybe you can spend more road time um, hitting those back roads, checking out the, the habitat that you're looking for and where you're gonna be finding birds. But, um, you know, out there scouting, breaking in your feet, breaking in your dog, getting in shape for the season is super important. But when you're out on the ground, you know, you're looking at, at those, trying to find those food sources and, and figuring that out. So there are a lot of resources that you can be looking for, uh, like you can be utilizing when you're doing that scouting from home or in the field. So every game and fish agency has bird distribution maps. Um, so sometimes they post them really easy and publicly on their website, but sometimes you got to do a little bit more digging, you know, calling your biologists and kind of figuring out the people that are your land managers, um, you know, developing relationships with them to, to help you access the maps that they have available for bird distribution or harvest numbers that can be a really valuable indicator for when you are doing some of that research to figure out where you want to be um, during your upland season. So I often advocate to talk to the people um, on the ground when you're also out hunting. Game wardens can be really valuable because they are often the most intimate or uh, with what's happening during that field season birds are getting harvested, where hunters are finding critters, you know, they they will, you know, they aren't biologists, but they can often give you very generalistic, like, what is happening in that specific location in that season. Um, and then there's seasonal technicians um, that are always out on the landscape as well, you know, biologists as they, as they move up in the ranks in their organizations, they often move into the desk job. So those, you know, those young seasonal technicians, if you see them out, make sure to, you know, thank them for doing good public land management and then ask them what they're seeing on the landscape.
Um, and then, you know, tools like Onyx and Google Earth are invaluable to, uh, to be checking out the landscape. Make sure you check the dates in which some of those satellite images have been taken because that'll indicate like, you know, it may look super, super green when the photo is taken in May and June, but by the time you're out in the ground in uh, September, October, November, it could look totally different. The amount of water. Yeah, the water dries up. Yeah, mm -hmm. like, you know, creeks that may look lush and verdant, you know, you get to them when you're hunting and your dog is like, Gone. No water here. And you're relying on it for, you had to get your dog in the water. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, any any kind of ideas, tips you would add, Courtney, um, when you are, you know, looking for birds, that habitat, that, that scouting? Yeah, no, and I think um, you touched on it a little bit about how it, it differs throughout the region of the U.S. Um, here in Montana, we want to see uh, birds are going to be near water in w northern Wisconsin and rough grouse woods. It's, it, there's moisture there, there's, there's a lot of cover, so they're going to be everywhere. There's, they're not going to be right next to the water necessarily. So, um, yeah, no, and I think uh, we talked about a little earlier is open up the crop of that bird mm -hmm. and, and see what they've been eating. Um, if it's full of berries, if it's leafy greens, and then when you're out um, hunting, look for that stuff. And, and you should be, get, be able to have more success getting the birds. Yeah, that's a great tip. One of my favorite crops that I ever opened was a dusky grouse and he had, uh, it was early season, but he had these like dried huckleberries in mm. his crop. I was like, ooh, you're going to eat good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing like a little bit of fruit with your meat. <laughs> totally, totally. So just, just some closing thoughts on, on this kind of, you know, very introductory, you know, how to find birds if you, if you're just getting into upland bird hunting, you know. Take breaks, observe the landscape, sit down, like get your dog some water, get get him a snack, um, get get that in you too, so that by the time you do get to that great habitat, you know, that perfect place where you're seeing, you know, all the money items, you know, the seats, the berries, the bugs, like whatever it might be, you know, you know that you and your dog are fresh and you're you're ready to go rather than, you know, being burned out by hiking all over the place and all of a sudden finding the money money spot. Yeah. So take breaks. Don't get frustrated. You know, I, it took me years to, to figure this out and I'm still very early on in my upland hunting uh, career, could, you could say. And, you know, just, you know, understanding that when we're hunting wild birds, you know, they're going to outsmart us. And that's also what we love about it. You know, we didn't have the benefit of growing up, you know, with that traditional family or knowledge about what this hunting experience is like especially over bird dogs. So, so give it time, um, practice wing shooting, you know, try to prepare yourself as much as you can before, before the hunting season. All right, so I'm gonna get into a little bit about the bird dog part of it. You can have success hunting without bird dogs. So there is that. Um, with Hannah's tips, I think you can definitely get into birds just knowing that habitat and what to find. But let me just tell you a little bit about adding bird dogs to this whole element. Pretty awesome, pretty awesome. And if you don't have one yet, um, I think there's a couple of tips I'd like to share of being able to find a dog and, and what would be a good one for you. First of all, you have to live with this dog. You want it to be good in your house if you have kids, good with the kids, um, and you wanna find one that has the genetics behind them to be able to hunt. How do you find that? So find a breeder that hunts. Um, you could have just gone out last weekend with somebody and hunted over their German Shorthair Pointer. That doesn't mean every German Shorthair Pointer is built the same way as that dog and is going to perform like that dog. Um, there's a lot of breeders out there. Not all are created equal. So I think, first of all, find a breed and break it down of Pointer versus Flusher. So your pointy breeds are going to be German Shorthair Pointer, German Wirehair Pointer, Wirehair Pointing Griffon. Hannah's got one of those, and she also has a poodle pointer. I have the German wire hairs and Brocco Italianos. If you're looking for a little bit of drool and uh, loudness in your life, look into a Brocco. If you're, you know, not too concerned about having a dog that possibly kills the neighbor cat or um, coyote. Last year we took one of our wire hairs hunting, and she just went over and killed a coyote and went back to bird hunting. So wire hairs have that. They have that little bit of an edge. Um, something 
things to be careful of. Vishlas, Weimariners, uh, small and large Munsterlanders, uh, Brock de Bernay, Francais. Like, <laughs> I mean, there's so many different breeds of pointers that we can get into. Um, but do a little bit of that research and also retrievers. So you have the Spaniels, which is Cocker Spaniel, English Springer Spaniel, very popular one, um, and American Water Spaniel. And then you have retrievers, Labradors, most popular breed out there. Everybody likes a Labrador. I like to call them a Labrador. Um, so spent some time with them. They're, they're a very fun breed. Um, great for the water. Great, great for the water. Uh, uh, what else do we have? Golden Retrievers, Flat Coated Retriever, Curly Coated Retriever. I might be missing some. I'm not going to catch them all, but but there's there's some out there. But look at those options because, again, you're not only going to be hunting with them, but you're going to be living at home with them. So it's uh, go out and visit the breeder. Meet the breeder. A lot of them should be more than happy to take you out hunting with them to see how their dogs work. Um, go to their house and see how their dogs are kept. What else? Yeah, health testing. Big, 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 huge health testing. So every, anybody can become a breeder. Anybody can have great hunting dogs and have a male and a female and put them together and have a litter of puppies. But are they health tested? Uh, do the research. OFA stands for Orthopedic Foundation for Animals. Each parent club has what's called a chick registration. Um, the newer breeds, so Poodle Pointers don't have chick yet, so go to National Parent Clubs, find out what are some common health issues in that breed that you are interested in, and make sure that the sire and dam of a litter that you are interested in getting a puppy from has clearances. Uh, with sporting dogs, uh, whether it's spaniels, retrievers, pointers, hips. I always make sure the hips are, are OFA rated. Um, Elbows are another big one, thyroid, uh, it, German short hairs are common, it's a cone degeneration of the eyes, so uh, cardiac or in uh, Labradors, EIC, the exercise induced collapse. These are all things that are going to affect your hunt, your dog's ability to enjoy hunting, and um, there's, there's ways to prevent it, and that's by getting a puppy from dogs that are health tested. Doesn't necessarily mean they're 100% guaranteed to not have a problem just because their parents didn't have a problem, but it's, it definitely is going to increase your chances of having a healthier dog that you can hunt for many, many years. Uh, once you have that dog, don't exercise it too hard until they're fully grown. Um, it's important to get your puppies out for that first season, though, and get them conditioned beforehand. What that can be is just off-leash walks, take them to the park, throw some balls for them, nothing that is going to be, um, I would say, like a controlled exercise. So don't leash them up and attach them to a bike. Don't run them off the four-wheeler at that age before they're two years old. Wait till all those bones and joints are completely formed, done growing, and then do it. But it is important because our early season hunting in most of the country is going to be in hot weather. And I know um, in South Dakota, every single year, there's a lot of dogs that are overheating and dying. So don't only condition your dogs in the morning. Uh, we like to do it midday when it's hot and, and be able to do some heat tolerance exercise with them and know the limit. Always take water, lots and lots of water anywhere you go. I like taking a camel pack. Do you take one of those when you're hunting, Hannah? Oh yeah, I wear that that hydration bladder, and then I often have extra water bottles. Yep. A friend of mine, we describe ourselves as uh, water mules for our dogs because, you know, it's not uncommon for them to go through four liters on me a day, especially early season. Until you know, we find that creek that they can dive into. It's right. It's huge. Right. Um, going back to a little bit about the pointers versus flushers. So pointing breeds, you're going to have, the type of hunt you're going to have with a pointing breed is, I should say, when they're trained or if they have really good genetics, they are going to, as soon as they get into scent on a bird, they're going to stop and point it. it it's, it's a beautiful thing. When you see them when they're getting on scent, their tails start, they go like this. As soon as they hit that scent, when they're coming in real hot, the tail stiffens up and just, um, whether it's, you know, at 12 o'clock or whether it's at 9 o'clock, but it stiffens up, they're on point. It is. It, it makes the, the, look it, 
I got the goosebumps just talking about it. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Um, but it's same thing. You know, when you're getting into a covey of birds, it's it's nice to be able to have that close distance and get into a better gun range and um, having a pointing breed for me uh, and, and I think for you, it's it's just nice to have that. Uh, safety purposes, you're not going to have a dog that's running around chasing up birds. Um, you have a better shot. It's And a lot of the pointing breeds are versatile gun dogs. So versatile meaning they hunt land and water, fur and feather, and uh, their track, their, um, their range for pointers is going to be a variable. And that's something, again, it's important to have a discussion with different breeders about before you decide on which breeder to go with because you have some breeders, you know, I'd say especially out over here on the West Coast where we prefer a bigger running dog. When you get out into Chucker Country or here in Eastern Montana, um, you want a dog that works out a little bit more in hitting those different objectives. In Northern Wisconsin or um, South Dakota pheasant hunting, you want a closer working dog because you could be getting into a lot of birds. There's, there's thicker, heavier cover, so it's nice to have that uh, closer working dog. Jumping into a close working dog, the flushing breeds. So these re the retrievers, the spaniels, they are really ideal for that. Um, I think I haven't hunted a lot over retrievers. Uh, I think a dream hunt on my bucket list would be um, you know, in South Dakota, when you have, if you're going with a group of people walking down that line, those those retrievers are going to be popping up birds right in front of you. That's a cool thing. I, it's just, it's a different kind of hunt because they're going to be flushing birds no matter where they are. And you just, it, it's people that enjoy hunting over them. They're constantly in action, really like to always be on the ball and, and going. Um, I think we're a little bit more lackadaisy with the pointing breeds because, um, you know, we're able to get in more. We're able to get mounted even sometimes before the bird gets up. So it all depends on what kind of hunting you like. I think each breed offers its very own um, advantage. And I mean, I wouldn't mind getting a little Cocker Spaniel just to throw down in the grouse woods, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I think I think they're pretty cool and a nice little dog uh, to have around the house and with kids. Um, and I have hunted over some Cocker Spaniels in when I went over to England on a hunt. And that's kind of the main breed that they use over there. They're a gentleman's gun dog. So lots of research to do in, in deciding on what, what different breed you like. What else? When you are getting, uh, when you're looking for a breeder as well, some another important thing, see if the breeder does testing, not just health testing, but also competition or evaluation type testing. So there's horseback field trials. Uh, you know, in the West here, when we like dogs that run a little bit bigger on, on those, in that bigger country, it's it's a bigger running dog. doesn't mean you need necessarily need a horse to hunt over it. It's always going to be that range. But um, a dog that has a dual champion in the field or one that's a master hunter, senior hunter, uh, our NAVDA organization, it stands for the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association. Those are all versatile dogs that are doing what I talked about earlier and there's different levels there. There's a natural ability test, which a lot of breeders use to evaluate their breeding dogs and what they're producing. And, um, you know, if they're not scoring out well, there's three different areas. It's pointing, swimming, and tracking. And that they test up until 16 months old. Then you have the utility option, which is a more advanced broke out dog. And it makes for a more enjoyable hunt. I mean, there really is nothing worse than hunting out there with an unruly, untrained wild dog regardless of what breed it is. Because if you have an independent dog that just wants to run out there and find birds, yeah, yeah, they will. They will, but they're going to be a couple hundred yards away busting birds. And that's not always the most fun thing. Some resources, if you are looking to train, um, like I was talking about the NAVDA organization, those are awesome. Usually there's chapters all over the U.S., uh, in Canada and Alaska. And um, they have training days every, almost every weekend or at least one weekend a month. And there's a whole bunch of people there that are super welcoming and just want to see you and your dog succeed and help you with training tips. I mean, it's free training advice. You're paying for the birds to go uh, put your dog on birds for that day and they are going to 
help you with it. There's a lot of YouTube videos out there to help with training. Uh, your breeder would be a good resource and how they've trained their dog, if they've used a certain dog trainer. Um, I think look into dog trainers. There's, there's a lot of dog trainers out there, but see that it's one that aligns with your method of training because there's a thousand different ways to train a dog. What else am I missing? <laughs> you, you hit so many different aspects of bird dog life. It is a vast and deep world. Mm -hmm. You know, the further you get into it, um, the more you find. And, you know, Courtney's podcast is great because she, she talks to people who are field trialing. And I didn't mm -hmm. know what field trialing was prior to listening to some of those episodes. Just, you know, you know, working with big running dogs on horseback is so cool. Mm -hmm. And I don't know it if is. I'll ever do it, but it's <laughs> an amazing world. Yeah. And, you know, it, everyone has an opinion and a method and, you know, their favorite breed and their favorite way of, you know, hunting and working with bird dogs. Mm -hmm. And I think it just takes getting out there and trying it, find some, find some friends, find some mentors, find some people who are willing to let you walk with them, even if you're not carrying a gun to see how their dogs work. And um, I was talking with a friend who is a dog breeder and an awesome human, and we were disagreeing on a certain topic. And he's like, just just leave it to getting into the bird dog world for us to have an <laughs> argument about this. And, it is. But we're, it we're is. We're passionate about it. And it yeah. is so rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, just going back to choosing that breed of dog, you know, for me, obviously, the wire hairs have been my staple since 2004 in, in our life. Um, but I picked up the Bracco Italiano purely because the first time I saw that breed, it, there we go with the goosebumps again. So watching a Bracco Italiano move is a beautiful thing. It's, they have what's called a flying trot. And for me, if I don't come across a single bird that day, I so thoroughly enjoyed watching my dog in the field. Just beautiful. Because that's what that dog was bred to do. And so find find a breed of dog that you just think is gorgeous. Um, I like to say life's too short to hunt over an ugly dog. So but for real, get get one that is that's pleasing to your eye um, and that can get the job done and the type of hunting that you want to do with it. Okay. So do you have a favorite favorite upland bird species? And also followed by mm. do you have a nemesis bird species? <laughs> Should I go to the nemesis yes, first? Yes, go to nemesis first. Yeah, okay. No, I'll go to the favorite because I got to be passionate and talk about the enjoyment of the positive things first. Um, I think for me, only because I rough grouse hunted so often, that was kind of my jam, that that is most enjoyable for me because it's a challenge. Um I'm not a great shot. I, I'm better now than I have been in the past, but uh, I I love so much about their habitat and the fact that you know, when we lived in Wisconsin, you know, they were so heavy in the in the North Woods there, and then I come here to Montana, and it is it's a different habitat that that we found them in um, last fall in, in just comparison because I thought oh I th thought it needed to be thicker and uh, you know the it should have been aspen that was seven to 10 years old and you know, on these two track logging trails and here it's just completely different. And, and we've just been kicking up rough grouse, just walking down our road. So, um, but yeah, the challenge of them when you're hunting in a more pressured area, I think it's, it's very tough. And I keep hearing these stories of how stupid grouse are and that they don't move and like, Never seen that. <laughs> Never seen that in my life. I would really love to come across that grouse that just stands there and stares at me, but I don't know that I could, I would feel wrong. Like we met eyes or something and we had some kind of a bond because hey, I, I don't know. Obviously it's like, you know, having, having a hunt, having a challenge. So that's good. Um, my nemesis is turkeys. <laughs> look at the shirt, look at the shirt. Yep. It, turkeys are dicks. <laughs> um, they are. I mean, I feel like, so... I was the president of my National Wild Turkey Federation chapter for years, and I'm out there, you know, pushing these turkeys, and let's do conservation, more turkeys, and um, I can tell you, I've turkey hunted for probably six years, and I have zero to count for, <laughs> and I just think, like, here, I mean, there's probably turkeys walking across the backyard here, or somewhere, and, and I can guarantee you in 10 days when turkey opener starts they're gonna be gone they aren't gonna be here and 
um, when I call them in, clearly they have issues with my turkey calls, but they move further away. <laughs> so they're my nemesis. And uh, while that's not hunting with dogs, um, some do hunt turkeys with doves. So we were just talking about that a little bit, about they're using dogs for like blowing apart a covey of turkey, if one should be lucky enough to have a covey of turkey. And then the idea is that the turkey will come back to to that location, and you can you can wait and be prepared, and you have to have a good dog that'll probably sit there and wait with you, right? Yeah, yeah. So one similar that you would have a waterfall hunting that's quiet yeah. in the blind, um, because. I've been kicked out of the blind before, waterfall hunting, because I had a squeaky dog. Oh, no. So, so it, it happens. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so I would assume something very quiet like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about for you, Hannah? What's your favorite <gasps> upland bird species? Well, my favorite and my nemesis is the same bird. Ooh. It is the greater sage grouse. And professionally, I am a sagebrush communications specialist, and so I talk day in and day out about sage grouse. So you think I would be like, you know, tuned in to figure out where this bird is For sure. in the sagebrush sea. And I have successfully shot one sage grouse and it was everything, you know, that we talked about in the habitat conversation. It was a little wet seep out in the dry prairie. There was some, some, you know, green forbs and dandelions and just those, those green groceries out in, in the dry prairie. And I was thinking, you know, this is good. This is good. And all of a sudden my Griffon's tail starts going and this, you know, this group of sage grouse get up and, you know, I get one bird out of it and, you know, I don't even let the dog retrieve it. I run up to and I pick up this bird and I <laughs> bawl my eyes out because it is such a, a beautiful bird that is, you know, um, a species of concern and that we as hunters, you know, and the conservation community are working so hard to recover that bird species. And like today we can still be hunting that bird while working towards that recovery is just, is just magic, but they are hard to find and you can put a lot of miles on your boots. States have really, um, you know, well-managed uh, restrictive seasons. And mm -hmm. here in Montana, we have one of the most liberal seasons where you can hunt the entire month of September. Um, and, uh, you know, other states, you have to apply for a permit to, to hunt in certain very, like, restricted districts. Or oh. the season is five days, and you can only take one bird in those five days. Wow. So um, it, it, it is an incredible species. It is a big bird. They are beautiful. You know, they've got the craziest mating dance. And, yeah. Um, so I love that I get to work for this species and also Can we see them. that? Can we see that? Oh, you want to see the mating dance? I do. I want to see the so, mating dance. So the sage grouse, the males, do this, like, amazing <laughs> strut, and they have these air sacs on their chest that they, like, hump back and forth. <laughs> and it's just, you you know, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't heard it, make sure to look up a sage grouse lucking video. Yeah. And, and don't take my dance. Well, hey there, public landowners. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Um, hope you guys learned a lot, but the best part of the evening is yet to come. So with us tonight, we have both Hannah Nikanow and Courtney Bastion, who you just listened to for 30 minutes, uh, share with you all of their, their wealth of knowledge. And now they're gonna be joining us for a little live Q and A. Um, so if you guys have any other questions, you know, feel free to add them to the ask a question tab. Uh, there's already a good number of them that we're going to get started with. And before we do that, I just want to, again, thank Hannah and Courtney um, for their time, not just tonight, but um, for recording this this video 
um, editing it. it. It did take a ton of time and we really, really appreciate it. So thank you so much for both being here and sharing all your expertise with us. All right. Um, so first question we got here. Um, would you suggest a male or female dog for first time bird dog owners and why? Ooh, you Courtney. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, you know, it's hard to say, uh, first time bird dog owner. I like the males personally. I feel like the males are really sweet and cuddly. Uh, my husband will tell you that he likes the females. They, he feels like they mature faster. Um, they're just ready to get after it a lot earlier, but they're also bitches, right? That's what we call them. So they come to you for affection when they want it, which is on their terms. Males, they'll take it all day long. <laughs> Yeah, I have, I have, uh, you know, we have a smaller dog stock than than Courtney does, and I have the two males for for some of those similar reasons. And but I do hear a lot of like, you know, the the hardcore big upland bird hunters that I know prefer the females for for some of those reasons. But um, I definitely like my pack of dudes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So it sounds like it could go either way. Definitely. Okay. Good to know. Um, so. Question from a BHA member out in the East. Um, they're, they're wondering, you know, in an area that there has less public land than out here in the West, here in Montana, um, there's a historically depleted upland species. Um, they have some rough grouse, but not very many. Um, what would you do if you were in their shoes? Would you just hit it hard in their state and try to figure it out? Um, would you travel to other states that have better bird populations or maybe more public land opportunities? Or would you just kind of swallow your pride a little bit and go hunt some, you know, put and take, you know, stock bird farms? Um, and then also the same person is wondering if you have any tips for non-dog owning uh, adult onset upland hunters. So someone like us who got into it a little bit later, but maybe might not have a dog with them. So kind of two-part question. Who wants mm -hmm. to take it? I'll, I'll take it for a step. So the answer is do it all, <laughs> you know, work, you know, number one, you know, work with your local BHA chapter to do some habitat projects, try to, you know, raise, raise money for, you know, planting seedlings or public land accesses or, you know, whatever it is in your state to, to, to invest in your home. You know, that's what's awesome about being public landowners and part of these organizations is that, you know, we have an ability to do so much as, as uh, backcountry hunters and anglers members, but also it's your home. You want to take care of it. So learn those those hidey holes and um you know work on figuring those out those magic little places to get a bird on your home turf is is i think i think that's you know pretty pretty amazing but then you know save up your time to do do a trip like do the research you know if you're going to come come out west to where there's maybe more public lands and you know study study the habitat hang out on google earth you know call biologists before the season because <laughs> during the season it gets really hard to to get them to to pick up that phone contact your fellow BHA members that that are in an area you want to go um, and so I think it's always worth it for like you and your bird hunting experience to, to try other places um, but but also to kind of also invest in yourself invest in your home and uh, to try try uh, finding those local birds too what do you got Courtney and also maybe you can get the second part of that question yeah about non yeah no people yeah, no, I just think, um, you know, living in Wisconsin up until a year ago, um, we we traveled three hours to get into grouse, right? So, um, and I know in Illinois, it's really tough for them to to find public land and wild birds in general. So I think travel, um, you know, the more dog species you can get under your belt and get your dogs on, the more you're going to find out about uh you as a hunter and your dog um, getting them in different types of cover because obviously the woods uh, rough grouse is going to be different than open prairies in south dakota so um yeah hunting without a dog yeah absolutely um it's you can you can do it just like kind of what hannah went through in her portion of the video of knowing and finding that habitat and what to look for you can get into them 
Um, I like the dogs a lot for the fact of uh, when you're, if you end your game, if you shoot it in really thick stuff, like, uh, like we have been for rough grouse here in the woods, really, really thick, so hard to find the birds. And um, I mean, I've had a dog this year that literally dug through a wood pile to pull my bird out. So they, they're really, really helpful that way, but you can be successful without it. Mm -hmm. Good point on, on bird recovery. That's a big one. For sure. Uh, so looking through the questions, we have a lot of questions about the dogs. So we'll get to that. We also have some questions <laughs> about gear. Um, but one other question we had more about like the preparation of the hunt, whether you have dogs or not, was uh, Jennifer asked, that, what is the best way to prepare for shooting before actually going out hunting? Um, would it be trap and skeet? Would it be hunting with a mentor or to just go out on your own and, and try to figure it out? What's your take? Um, I think the more shooting you can do, the better beforehand. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, trap, skeet, you know, it could be sporting clays. Uh, I think the most important part is getting to know your gun, getting fit properly for your gun, because that's going to be the first part in being successful in shooting it and feeling comfortable with it. I don't know how many women I've helped already just try to get comfortable with that gun of putting it in their shoulder in the right spot, right in the pocket and pulling the trigger. Cause a lot of them are wincing, uh, closing their eyes and just worried about that portion of it. So once you can get over that, um, you're, you're going to be better off, but getting over that is going to be the more shooting, the better, whether it's out in your backyard, go sporting clays, anything, anything you're doing, finding a mentor is going to be good. in the fact that they can get you out and take you hunting. But, um, I personally would like to take somebody out that's already comfortable with their gun that has gone through that phase before they're shooting over my dogs. Yeah, for the first time this year, I, you know, called, called friends saying, I want a professional to talk to about some of the problems I'm having in wing shooting. And so over the summer, I, I met up with the person who, who teaches skeet shooting uh, competitively, but I'm like, I, I, I want to shoot birds. I don't just want to compete. Um, and, you know, he was able to tailor it to, to that. It's like, so in this situation, this is what would be like a crossing shot. This is what the bird would look like. He talked about picking a part of the bird versus just, you know, you know, kind of the, the instinctual just shooting and you get to that point, but having a professional rather than your partner or just a friend who puts a gun in your hand, I really benefited from that. And it's, and it's shown so far this season. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so are you ready for some fun questions about dogs? Everyone wants to talk about dogs. Of course, always. All right. Um, <laughs> so Sean asks, thoughts on using non-traditional bird dogs? We own two working dogs, a rough collie and Australian shepherds. Any chance they could be trained to at least locate birds or is it not even worth the effort? Absolutely. All dog breeds can track. Um, and and smell i mean we we don't take advantage enough of the ability of our dogs noses so absolutely they can they can find birds and that's just going to be a matter of introducing them beforehand uh get a get some of those game birds that you're planning on hunting uh get some quail get some chucker you can get those as pen raised birds and start doing some introduction with that and uh, just basic tracking drills with them you yeah, bet. Collies, those working breeds, they're smart. So that could be mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Actually, I just, I went down to my honey hole the, uh, this afternoon of rough grouse and I saw two collies coming out of there. <laughs> so they definitely can do it. Nice. Sounds like there's yeah. hope. Yeah, there's definitely hope. Yeah. All right. So Emily asks, what are some good tips for training a gun dog while living in an urban area, i.e. somewhere where you can't exactly go shoot a gun? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a, tough a tough one. one. And, and I, I think, think so, so Hannah, Hannah, you can, can attest, attest to, to, you know, raising, raising pigeons, pigeons, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm raising pigeons in city limits right now and working on getting these homing pigeons to home, to places where I can be shooting. And it's proven really hard. This is my COVID project and I haven't yet got them to a place. 
And so those resources that we talked about, the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association, like the local NAVDA chapter in my area, they have a homing coop and they have uh, hunting grounds, private hunting grounds associated with that, you know, the, the property where they have those pigeons. And so like in preparing my, my puppy for their natural ability test, we use the, the clubs while pigeons just work with the chapter. And so that was super crucial because I don't have the land, you know, I live in town and, you know, we did go out, we did have places on, pri on public lands where we got out further enough where we could shoot, you know, a blank out of a, a cap gun or uh, eventually kind of worked up to make sure the puppy wasn't gun shy before the season. But it takes, it takes effort and kind of those clubs, those private clubs, there is cost to them, but the resources that they have available, the permits, the insurance, like it's it's really worth it to find those organized groups. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we lived in town, we did the same thing with our um, NABDA chapter. We would, they had training days once a month, we take the dogs to, um, but I think also you can find a good trainer in your area. I know um, we do a lot of one-on-ones here with people that live in town and don't have the resources. So they come out once a week and we do one-on-one -on -one training with them and help guide them along. So. Yeah, and one thing that I was told when we started with the puppy really early on is taking a pot and a spoon while they're eating food and bang that pot and be like, good dog, good dog, like making all the noise taking two pieces of two by fours and clapping them together, making that big snap, just getting them used to like loud sounds are good, good things. Yeah. I had a friend who used to use a cap gun. <laughs> it's louder up until you go louder. <laughs> All right, a couple more training questions. Um, Eric asks, about to get my first bird dog, a GSP from a solid line of hunting dogs. You mentioned not running them too hard until they were two years old and fully grown. What would you recommend that you do to train them the first two years? Um, I'm thinking you mean like exercise wise, um, and that's just gonna be off leash. So don't, if you're gonna go running, um, you know, just leave them off leash. Don't do a controlled type of run. Don't force them to do it. Um, up, until up until two, two years, years old, old hiking, hiking. Um, we, we do, do a, a lot, lot of ball, ball throwing, throwing in the yard. yard. So, so they, they can, can do, do that, that type of stuff, stuff. just, just not, not uh, I would I say, would say not, not more than, more than 20, 20 minutes, minutes. and um, take, um, it, take easy it easy on them, watch, watch the surface, surface that they're, they're working, working on. on. Yeah, I had, I had asked the Bastions with our puppy, like we went shed hunting and I was like, is this too much on, you know, a six, seven, eight month old dog? And I think you guys told me if the dog doesn't want to go, then stop. But um, they've got a lot of energy and, you know, we do a couple of miles. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be too, too crazy, but um, it was all off leash and controlled. And when he started squeaking, you know, we picked him up and we started walking out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have, we have a five month old right now that we're taking out for maybe like one hunt a week and about 30 minutes, uh, 30 to 45 minutes really tops. And, you know, after that, just pick her up. And that's the nice thing about having one of those nice big bird vests, too. You can throw that, you know, that younger dog in your bird vest and carry him that way. Good deal. So, one other dog training question. Um, so the question is, came, comes from Dave, and Dave wants to know if you train obedience first or bird skills first. Mm. Uh, kind of in alignment, really. Uh, they, they really go hand in hand because when you're introducing birds, you're putting, uh, whether it's verbal commands or just cues to it, but... Um, Obedience is going to have to be a must because that's a structure thing. So do the sit, the down, the place, do all your basic obedience because you're going to continue to work those commands through the entire course of bird work as well when you're introducing birds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had a good point, Courtney. We were talking about down and how uh sometimes down can be like down like stop jumping off of jumping on me versus like lay down like you want a dog to lay down in a blind or do whatever and you guys yeah. use off 
we use off yeah. um, to, to get off of you and then right. down because that's what you want in the tool and so kind of in yeah. hindsight I'm like oh I wish I would have done that yeah <laughs> and that's a that's a really common thing it's good you brought that up Hannah because um, we do have uh, some puppies going home this week and we had a new family come over here and one of our older dogs was doing a little bit of jumping on them and they were saying down, down, down. And, you know, right there, those dogs get confused because when you're saying down and then you're using that command later on to say lay down or down, uh, you, know, you need to be really clear with what you're asking of them. We say off. So it's off and get off the countertop get off jumping on me, get off of the couch instead of down. That means lay down. Mm -hmm. Good points. So Catherine and Lauren have some gear questions. So together their questions are asking for your advice on one piece of essential or must have gear for either you or your dog. And then also one piece for either you or your dog that is your favorite piece of gear. Oh, that's so tough. <laughs> Hannah, you go first, because I mean, they're narrowing it down to one for me, so this is very tough. <laughs> okay, okay. I actually have a, a few demo items. So my favorite piece of gear for myself is, I'm opening it up right now, is my bird knife. It's kind of a skinny blade, you know, and I use it for processing birds, but I use it for you know, cutting the burr out of my hair that I can't get out, you know, to, to <laughs> like my dog who is, you know, caught in something like a, either a roper, or like a, a duck decoy blind. I had that issue this week, you know, cut that, that string because the dog's tangled up in it. Um, I, this, this knife has a, a choke wrench in it. Um, which I find more often than not, like something's happening in the field. I'm like, oh, I need a wider choke or I need a tighter choke. And so that's in here. And then this does have a gut hook where you can use it to gut. I don't, I don't like it. It's, I've used it um, uh, for like crocheting or, you know, goofy things to make it useful. But um, having a knife in my pocket at all times for, for safety situations, for digging stickers out of my fingers, that's my favorite personal gear. And then... Um, I recently went to the Garmin Pro 550 uh, GPS and um, kind of uh, stimulation. So it has a tone, light, vibrate, and shock on my dogs. Just the peace of mind that this has given me in controlling my dogs, in finding my dogs when I'm in thicker cover. Um, I do really, really love this. My dogs respond really well to the tone. Um, so when it's windy and my voice or my whistle can't project out to them, there's that beep. And, you know, you know, he reacts really, really well to that. He knows beep come, means come back, come find me. Um, uh, you know, I, I've thought about this situation like porcupine or skunk and just being able to quick, you know, get them to turn around, um, fence, cliff, whatever it is. I really like um, a good e-collar. Courtney? <laughs> uh, I'm still not ready. <laughs> um, you know, I'd I'll, say I'll, I'll give you my, a couple more seconds to think about it. And I'll just add that I could really have used that sort of collar a couple times this year when Leo has been my dog, my lab has been sprayed by a skunk twice. Uh, <laughs> and he doesn't he doesn't react yeah. and come right back to me with the beep as well as Rye does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And, and I think we have the Garmin Alpha 100. Um, and it's it's fantastic. It just that peace of mind. You know, you don't have to use it. It is an e collar, right? So it does have the electronics. You don't have to use that for the dog. More than anything, it's just nice to be able to see exactly where your dogs are. Um, and like I tell you, my favorite my favorite piece of equipment this year, my essential, is my uh, my Garmin watch, and that is because it sinks in with that Garmin Alpha and, and even uh, the one that Hannah has, the Pro 550 Plus. And it tells you um, right on your watch where your dog is. It shows you an arrow uh, 100 yards this way. Or the, and I, I usually run two dogs, so the other dog will show 30 yards this way. And what's nice about that is because I'm always holding my gun. I'm always ready, right? Because like the more ready and quicker to mount I am, the more... The, better chance I have of getting a shot. So when I'm holding that gun, I don't have to hold that large handheld 
with my hand to know where my dog is, right? So I'm holding my gun and all I have to do is turn my watch this way and I can see where my dog is. So if I'm in South Dakota on the prairie, this isn't gonna be necessary. Here, when I'm rough grouse hunting, um, you know, in thicker cover, it's it's really, really nice because I have no idea where my dogs are. And if, I, if I'm hearing flushes, you know, a hundred yards over this way and I like, is my dog over there flushing that bird or, or what's going on? So that's really nice. Um, but besides that, I think having a really good strap vest is, is what I appreciate. And that's been kind of my nemesis this year and finding the proper strap vest. And I have, uh, I actually have a collaboration of two different brands of vests right now because one has a great, uh, space, uh, space for, for water. water. I, can I can fit two, two water bottles, bottles on each side and I can fit a water, water bladder in the back. back. Um, but, but the strap, strap on that, that one originally was, was right in my pocket, pocket. And, and, and pulling in there. So I was so having trouble uh, mounting. mounting. So, uh, uh, the, the vest, vest that my that husband, husband uses, he put his straps on my vest and that's perfect because there's no padding here and I'm mounting really well. So I kind of have a hybrid vest right now until, um, figure something else out. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for sharing your uh, favorite and most essential pieces of gear, ladies. Um, we do have a couple more questions, but I just want to make sure that folks tuning in, um, stick around for a few more minutes because at the end, we're going to be announcing the door prize, which was generously provided by our friends at Filson. Um, it's a dry duffel and a beanie. It's valued at $274. So we'll be announcing that here shortly. Um, and thanks again to Philson just one more time for, for allowing us to, to make this event happen. Um, we do have a couple of more of these uh, Philson Skills Nights um, still on the docket. We have one in just a couple days on October 7th, and then we have another one next week on October 12th. Uh, there's more information about those, time they start, what we're covering um, at the backcountryhunters.org website. So a couple more questions. Then we'll announce the winner and uh, thank you guys one more time. Um, so what uh, Michael wants to know, what's the easiest bird to hunt as someone brand new to hunting with a dog? Uh, and pheasant. We try to be like <laughs> geographical if we can provide a couple answers for people maybe in the East, people in the West, um, because I know, you know, not all bird species are found everywhere. Yeah, I think that's hard. I think it's hard to say, but I, I, I just throw pheasant out there only because they're a nice big bird. They get up, you know, slow, a little more slow than the other birds. Um, but to be fair, I haven't hunted several other birds yet. So chucker, uh, quail, um, you know, there's certain ones I haven't hunted, but I can tell you, I've heard that chucker is a big challenge to hunt in general. So I'm not gonna even- I think we can eliminate chucker from the UVS. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. I, I'd have to, I'm going to stick with pheasant. I agree. Um, pheasant, you know, you can hunt them, you know, they are often a, a early, early season, you know, these are all generalistic terms, but they are often a tighter holding bird where over working you know, over dogs, you know, you can often get good bird work to give you good, it's good preparation, you know, you know, either the flusher is getting birdie or your pointer is on point. Um, they were what I learned on. Uh, they're also, I found one of the most infuriating birds because they are tough and they run and, um, you know, they always do what you don't expect them to do. And you can only, and it kind of, unlike other upland bird species, you can often only shoot the roosters. So you have to, there's always that concern that they be very, you know, sure of, you know, rooster hen, you know, always, you know, hoping that you and your hunting buddies shout. I always like say, shout rooster, shout hen, like, like, like yeah. indicate what you're going for. So, so they're challenging in that sense, but also there's a lot of opportunities for put and take, um, uh, you know, youth hunts or uh, your game farms where you can have that, you know, that controlled private, you know, essentially domesticated experience to prepare yourself for what, what will be in the field. Yeah. So we actually had a bonus follow-up question from Sarah. Um, you, got, you got her mind going when you're talking about the vests. Uh, so, Courtney, uh, the question is, what type of upland vest do you think fit women best? <laughs> and, uh, okay, so it, oh, that's hard. So, Proist makes a vest for women. 
Um, Proas has a fantastic line, and oh my goodness, I, I, they they have forty percent off going like right now until I think October eleventh. Um, forty percent off is huge. Um, I'm a pro staff on Proas, and that's my discount. So I mean, by all means, go check out their upload pants. Those are uh, for sure. But okay, back to the vest situation. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, they have, have a great, great vest. vest. Again, my, my, my only issue with that, that is, is that there is some padding on that vest, vest um, on the straps. straps. So, so um, uh, I, I like the, the, the final rise vest is a new one this year. Um, Matt Davis and his wife in Idaho are uh, out there just really chomping at the bit, making them right there in their house. And it's a fantastic vest. I, I know that they say it's the lightest on the market. Uh, my husband has it. He loves it. He had a Wingworks in the past and Wingworks isn't making them anymore. So, um, you know, I really can't tell you enough good things about the final rise vest. I, I, I use the straps of it on my Proist vest because um, for me, I really went through a lot this year on making sure I had the right gun and had it fit properly. And that was really the only thing that kind of burdened me at the very end was having some padding on there that was um, causing me some issues and just putting that final rise straps on there made a big difference. So, And I, I wear the Badlander uh, vest when I'm doing kind of my longer hunts where I'm going to be out for multiple, multiple hours. And it does have that little bit of padding, but it has a super good pocket for your hydration bladder. It's got like, because of layers and you know, you start going up the mountain, you're stripping off layers left and right because you're sweating. Um, it's got a good like zippered interior pouch separate from where you're putting your birds so that your layers aren't getting all bloody when you're sticking the birds back there. It's got big um, snap buckle um, containers on the hips for your shells. And I like that they have a true snap because I totally had the experience with the vest where there's just like the little um, little pockets that you put the your shells in. And as I walk, my legs, because I'm short, I'm 5'2", my legs push out my shells, like pop my shells out of uh, my hip area. And so I've gone to reload and had only half my shells having kicked them out somewhere in the field. And so shooting with your vests on, you know, in archery, you practice with your bino bra, you know, with rifle, maybe you practice with your pack on, practice upland skeet shooting with your vest on so that you have that, that realistic situation. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so we're wrapping up our time here, so I just want to make sure we announce our winner and then ask the final question. Um, so drum roll, please. Uh, the Wilson Dry Duffel and Beanie is being awarded to Nicole Silverman. So Nicole, congratulations. We will get a hold of you and make sure you can collect your, your winnings. Uh, thanks again to Filson. I also encourage you guys to click that green bar at the bottom of the screen right now where it says check out BHA and Filson Clap Gear. You can see uh, those caps that these two ladies are modeling for us. Uh, there's also some uh, beanies, a t-shirt, and a vest that Filson and BHA have collaborated to, to put out. They're, they're pretty slick. Um, they're the high quality Filson gear, but also you can show off your BHA pride. So please definitely take a look at those. And final question tonight, um, what is the most surprising thing you've ever found in a crop? Uh, <laughs> so the one that comes to the top of my mind, not totally surprising, but just wonderful. The, the rough grouse, Courtney and I, uh, grouse hunted together this year and all of the, I, I think almost all the birds that we brought in at our grouse camp um, had rose hips in the crop and I just had made a rose hip simple syrup to mix with some whiskey to drink at camp that night and so just you know you open up that crop and it's just that brilliant red ruby red uh, color in there and then you know you're thrashing through thorns and you, you know I'm still probably picking out thorns from my forearms um, uh, so it's just it's just such a part of the, the element of, of um, some of our early grouse hunting this year so that was that was surprising and good yeah Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know about the craziest thing. I, I remember like opening up going, oh my gosh, it's full of maggots. And then I actually opened it. And it was like just a whole bunch of grasshoppers. <laughs> but actually yesterday, um, the crop I opened that we opened up, it was like just 
full of rose hips and the bird it was really kind of out of territory it was up on a hill oh in like wide open area just eating berries and it was probably like 6 30 at night so it was getting ready to roost and really filling up that crop and that bird got off the ground really really slow because <laughs> and I, I think i posted a picture of it on my instagram page but it's like suit is is the most full crop i've ever seen it was loaded it looked like you had picked for 30 minutes and then like put them on the bird like it was pretty insane <laughs> right right it was <laughs> Awesome. Well, that was a seamless transition, Courtney. You mentioned your Instagram page. And I was just going to ask where viewers might be able to find you guys, uh, figure out, you know, kind of how to get more of your information and so they can utilize it. I know you mentioned you have a podcast. Please, please let us know where we can find more from Courtney and Hannah. Yeah, so I have uh, the Bird Dog Babe podcast. Um, I have an Instagram page, the Bird Dog Babe and a Facebook page, the same, and you can follow it there. Uh, there's a lot of fun details and information on the podcast. Uh, one right now I'd recommend to everybody that has bird dogs. Um, I don't remember the exact episode number, but it's on um, bird dog first aid, you know, what you should carry in your vest with you while you're out in the field and some of the essentials to keep in the truck. So that was a really good one. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. And I'm just at Hannah Nicanow, Nicanow, N-I-K-O-N-O-W on, on Instagram. And you'll just see pictures of Griffons and Poodle Pointers and, and then sharing Courtney's content. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much, ladies. We really appreciate your time. Thank you to everybody who, who uh, joined in. And thanks again to Filson. Uh, we'll see you all in a few nights for another skills night. See ya. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Oh, so we're supposed to hang up now. I don't know. You guys are awesome. Let's hang up. You guys are good. Yep. Oh, we're good. Okay. Okay.